Today on The Future of Everything, the future of lip syncing. You know, for some of us, lip syncing refers to the practice of having performers on stage move their lips and sync with a recording of a song while they're allegedly singing. Sometimes it's a recording of that performer themselves made previously. Sometimes it may be even a different person. And there's always some controversy about the practice. Sometimes there are good reasons like on New Year's Eve in, in uh, Times Square, it's freezing. It might not be good for the voice. So you do a lip sync or you might have some stage fright uh, or you wanna exactly replicate your recorded uh, song. But sometimes there is a different intent to maybe mislead about who's actually doing the singing. Um, I have, I must confess, spent lots of time watching videos on YouTube, trying to figure out if it was a, a lip sync or a true live performance. Well, let's fast forward now to 2021. Lip syncing is taking on a much broader meaning. Uh, now we're thinking about the ability to use computational AI technologies to create very realistic video of a person speaking words with their mouth and with their lips, uh, where it's extremely hard potentially to tell if this is a real person and if this is really what they said. Now, for animation and, and uh, entertainment, this can lead to very realistic movies with computer generated actors speaking and moving their lips and mouths in very realistic ways. As humans, I should say, and I think we all know this, we're extremely good at watching lips and mouths as part of our comprehension of speech. And we can be very sensitive to odd or wrong appearance while someone's talking. In fact, we all know that there are hearing impaired people who get huge amounts of information by watching what's being said and can often read the lips of a speaker um, with great sensitivity. But the worry is that this technology may also lead to a new generation of fake news, basically, where people are getting very realistic videos of well-known and perhaps trusted people saying things that they don't believe that they've never said. Imagine the chaos uh, that could result from fake videos videos created by people with political agendas. Well, Professor Manish Agrawala is a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford University, and he works on these technologies for creating realistic lip syncing. Manish, what attracted you to work on these technologies in the first place? Yeah, so um, for me, I've always been interested in developing visual content creation tools. Uh, and more recently, audio as well. Tools that will make it easier for people to create um, photographs and video and songs and, and audio in a variety of different ways, um, but that are maybe easier to use and allow more flexible control. And so uh, one of the things that we got interested in uh, many years ago now is allowing for more flexible video editing. Um, and as part of that, um, one of the domains that we got interested in was um, talking head video. So a mm -hmm. lot of the video that you see is of people speaking to a camera. <laughs> Indeed, we're doing that right now in some sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, um, and that kind of video is, is prevalent. And a lot of the information in that video is conveyed through the speech. Um, and so uh, we uh, uh, went on this journey to try and produce tools that would make it easier to edit that kind of video, to get it down to the pieces of speech that would uh, really be interesting or the highlights and string them all together. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so a few years ago, we made a tool that would allow you to um, cut out a piece of a long talking head video and, um, uh, and paste it together with another part of that same video. So uh, you could remove words or remove sentences and so on. Um, and this can be really useful. We could remove all the uhs and ums in the speech, for example. Uh, and, I totally get that. Uh... Yes. <laughs> and so, and so uh, with that kind of a tool, 
you can make the speech clearer, you can make the video clearer. This is a, you know, a useful thing as a, as a teacher that is teaching by video a lot. Right, right, um, and concise, get the point across and... Yeah. So, 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 so this um, as an editing tool makes sense. And I'm sure like the entertainment, but also the news and the general film and video production industry must be very excited about the possibility of having these tools. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, at that point, when we first built this kind of tool, all it could do was um, allow you to rearrange parts of the existing video and delete parts of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, and, and I, I should add that the key feature of that tool was that you could uh, get a transcript of the speech in the video and cut, copy, paste the words in order to edit the video. Right, right. So that was Very powerful. Yeah. And then the second key feature is that it could hide the transitions. So usually if there's a cut in a talking head video, you will see a, uh, a jump cut. Sure, like the, the face moves or the speech doesn't seem perfectly fluid. Exactly. And so, um, and so another key feature of that tool is that we could smooth the, those cuts so that, so that it appeared seamless. Right. Okay. So now how does this get to lip syncing? So this all sounds like somewhat, what I would call somewhat conservative editing. That's but right. where in that workflow do you say to yourself, uh-oh, I, I need to get the lips to move and they need to, need to be realistic and they need to say you know, the following things. How, how did that come up in the work? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, so, so that work was, was useful that I just talked about, but limited because yeah. you could only essentially delete or move what already existed. And so um, a couple of years ago, we thought, well, could we extend this further? Could we make it so that you could type in a new word and generate the corresponding video so that it appears like the person is speaking that right. new word? Uh, and so that's a question of, can we do the lip sync? Can mm -hmm. we make the visuals appear consistent with that word that I got you? And, uh, and so uh, we developed a tool that would allow you to do exactly that. It will take uh, your video that you've captured, let you type in new words and generate the video that corresponds to the new words that you've typed in. So that's amazing. So just for, for, the, for the lay audience who finds this to be like approaching magic, can you give us a sense of why this is possible? What are the things you're taking advantage of computationally? Uh, I guess, and also there's a question down the line of how good is it? But first of all, tell us a little bit under the hood how this works. Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, so um, the way this works is that we have a, uh, we record the person for maybe 10 minutes saying a variety of sentences. And in those raw recordings, we've captured all the lip motions for the various phonemes and the various words that they are saying. And so when we wanna generate a new word or a sequence of words, what we are essentially doing is taking those text words, breaking them into phonemes and then looking up. And a phoneme, phoneme is just a little is. fragment of a word, like the little sound for a three syllable word. Perhaps there's something like three phonemes, something like that. Yeah, yeah. You, you can think of a phoneme as corresponding to roughly a syllable. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and a phoneme uh, is, is a short piece of sound <laughs> that corresponds to a part of the word as, as uh, you just said. And, uh, and so, uh, because we have this big database, 10 minutes of the, of the person saying a variety mm -hmm. of different words, we can look up in that database where that uh, phoneme was said before and copy the lip motions into okay. the new video. Okay, so that's really fascinating and, 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 okay, and that makes perfect sense. But a couple of follow-up questions there. Yeah. Um, there, I assume, therefore, that there's um, no real model of the musculature of the mouth. Are, are we looking at like, oh, I know how their lips move, or is it simply copying from that example that you have previously? Yeah, it's simply copying. There's no model of the 
face, the lips, the the mouth. None of that is there. There oh. is an underlying 3D head model ah. to get the shape and the visuals correct. <laughs> um, oh, so because a 2D mouth might not be good enough for figuring out how to make my lips look realistic. That's right. And then the other question is, I know in some in some of this AI deep learning that you've trained on hundreds or thousands or millions of other people or other examples. Are, yeah. are you using a general background model of how people talk in general, or is it all from that 10 minutes? Yeah, uh, another good question. So we build a model for each person okay. that we're going to generate. Um, Great. So we, uh, we require... Uh, at this point, several minutes of audio and video of that mm -hmm. person. And, and I guess you can control the text that they read to make sure you get a nice, a nice yes. potpourri of uh, phonemes, as they would yes. say. So yeah. let me ask, how do you evaluate when you're doing well and when you're not doing well? Is it simply yeah. you and your team watching the video saying, yeah, that looks cool? Or yeah. uh, is there a more formal evaluation? Um, and how would you characterize the current quality of those lip movements? Yeah, so um, the first step is always for us to look at the video <laughs> and decide if it's, <laughs> you know, can we tell that it was generated or right. not? Right, right. Um, and if it passes that test, that's a pretty high bar because we're looking very carefully. And you at, know all the bugaboos of how it could go wrong. Yeah, yeah. And when we're feeling pretty good about that bar, then what we will do is um, run these crowdsourced experiments. So we will put up, uh, we will show uh, crowd workers, people uh, that we've recruited through Amazon's Mechanical Turk or other, or other sites to look at videos. We won't tell them whether it's computer generated or uh, an original video and ask them to tell us how realistic it looks. Um, and, um, you know, for short, for short edits, uh, the videos that we're able to produce look pretty realistic these days. Um, it's very difficult to tell, uh, if you're just glancing at the video, yes. uh, that it's computer generated. And, and I'm guessing just because of the general way that things move in this, in this field, that the year on year improvement is quite remarkable. So real fans of the future of everything will remember that you and I spoke a couple of years ago. And if I were to compare the technologies back then to what you can do now, would I notice a, a qualitative difference in the quality? Yeah, you would probably notice a small difference, but even a couple of years ago, we were pretty good. Okay. And so really what's happened, and you can see this with uh, all the videos, the, the so-called deep fake videos that have yes. been out on the internet. So the, the Tom Cruise video that you might have seen recently is a great example. It's very, very difficult to tell. So the quality of these things is, is really quite high at this point. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Manish Agrawala about this amazing capability to generate uh, entertaining and realistic uh, lip synced talking heads. So let's go to the question that I'm, I'm sure everybody is thinking is, what about the nefarious uses? Do you consider that to be part of your challenge or is that somebody else's problem? And, and, and how do you think about this? Yeah, it's an important issue. <laughs> and um, I think when you're developing any kind of tool, it's important to think through the implications and how the tool can be used for both positive and negative purposes. And uh, certainly deep fakes for misinformation and disinformation is a very active topic and, and people are discussing it quite a bit. And we're discussing it a lot in, in my lab, in my group, and with the broader public at some level. Yes. Um, and in fact, when we when we wrote the paper on some of this uh, recent work, uh, we put in a section right in the introduction that was an ethical considerations section. <laughs> right. Uh, and if you go to the web page about the work, you can also see that uh, ethical considerations statement. Um, so, uh, so we thought quite a lot about this. And, um, you know, I think we want to acknowledge that there are lots and lots of positive uses of this kind of technology. 
Um, for example, I'm uh, currently working with uh, Dr. Fred Baig in the medical school here at Stanford. Um, he performs laryngectomies. And when you've had a laryngectomy- Which is basically uh, the removal of your vocal cords, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if they're removed. Or at least or, part uh, of your larynx, which- Yes, is, yeah, your is larynx it? is removed, right? right. <laughs> uh, and so after you've gone through that surgery, you need to use what's called an electrolarynx to speak, okay? This is a little vibrating device. You might've seen some smokers sometimes use these devices yes. that have had surgeries. Um, and you hold it up to your throat and you speak. And um, what comes out is a voice, but it's very robotic sounding. Yes. It's your voice, but it's, it's really robotic. It doesn't sound natural at all. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been working on with, uh, with Fred is developing these kinds of technologies to record a little bit of uh, the patient's voice before the surgery. Oh. And then use that to generate their voice after the surgery. So we can take the electrolarynx generated voice and translate it in, back into their original voice so that it sounds a lot closer. Uh, that, that is fascinating. So just so I understand, they probably can still move their lips unless the surgery has affected their mouth, but that's kind of, it's kind of irrelevant because there's no wind passing through the mouth. So the, they'll still be doing their mouth movements, but there's a disconnect. And some of us have seen this and on TV, even in commercials, um, you will see the lips moving, but as you said, that robotic sound creates a disconnect. So if you could have uh, perhaps a more, I'm just checking that I'm understanding. Um, yeah. If you could have a more sophisticated output box at the at the larynx, creating more realistic sounds that match what you're seeing in the in the lip movement, it would be less jarring and lead to a more natural communication. Right. Uh, Fascinating. Uh, 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 and you know, ultimately, a better quality of life for this uh, post-surgery patient. So this is a great. Yeah, this is whenever we discuss new technologies, there are always these spin-off secondary uses that may not have been on your mind when you first initiated the project. And in many ways, it, it is why you do the research uh, just to get the capability. Because yes, there's ethical issues, but here's an example where all of a sudden now patients who've had a laryngectomy are are potentially benefiting from it. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's a kind of specific example. The thing that uh, maybe I'm, I will say, I, I, I feel most strongly about goes back to my interest in this whole, whole area in the first place. So I am very interested in making tools that make it easier to create content, to tell stories. And um, the technologies that we've built to edit talking heads and to do lip syncing, those can be used to create and tell stories and they can facilitate that. They can make it easier for people to edit video and tell the stories that they wanna tell. And I think telling stories is one of the central things in human culture. Yeah. Right? So I really believe that it's important to, to build these kinds of tools that can help us create culture that will allow more people to create and tell their stories. And so to me, that's, a, that's a, uh, one of the kind of driving forces and one of the, the positive use cases. Now, all of that said, <laughs> we certainly recognize that these can be used, that these tools can be used to create misinformation and disinformation. And, um, and so, the, the, you know, in our ethical considerations, we talk a little bit about how we hope these tools will be used. So we think it is critically important if you're gonna use these kinds of tools that the audience understands that these were manipulated videos, <laughs> right? That they were that you know you can yes. do this by watermarking you can do this implicitly so if it's a fictional video right if it's a if it's a 
Marvel Cinematic Universe everybody gets uh, it film everyone knows that it's not yeah. real right um so uh so when you see princess leia <laughs> in the right. you know in the star wars film you know that that's a, a manipulation but joe um, biden is a different right kettle of fish it can be i mean there's the issue of parody as well right, right. you can use parody uh, and when it's clear that something is a parody it's okay um so so um so but we, but we think that it is important that a, a, an audience would somehow know that this is uh, has been manipulated. Um, that's on one side, <laughs> but there's another side of this as well. And we think that it is also very important that the performer that is being manipulated is also aware of the manipulations. Mm. Okay, and that gets at one of the real I, I, I think with deep fakes, the biggest issues these days are not around political disinformation and misinformation. It's really around deep fake porn. Porn, like pornography. Porn. Yeah, pornography. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that's a huge issue these days. Well, uh, this is the future of everything, and we are going to learn more about that. I'm Russ Altman. I'm more with Professor Manish Agrawala next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Manish Agrawala about lip syncing and deep fakes. And at the end of the last segment, we had an intriguing comment about you believing that one of the major risks here is deep fake pornography. So tell me what the construct is that leads you to that concern. Yeah, so um, uh, there have already been reports of people using deep fake tools and lip syncing tools to generate pornography. Huh. And what they will do is take an existing pornographic video and paste on someone else's head without their, their consent. Um, and that is extremely problematic for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, this is why when you're ethically using these kinds of tools, it is critically important that the people that appear in the video know what is being done. And, and that should be, if not, it should certainly be a general expectation. And there may, you may need to give it more teeth in terms of things like laws or regulations. Um, do, it, it, in, it, with respect to that, how, um, how do you distribute your code? I know there's often a spirit of free exchange of ideas and often in, in the computer world, people share open source code to help accelerate the field. It, it, it occurs to me that you might have a little bit of a tricky situation with distributing your code um, just because of these concerns. Yeah, so this is an open discussion that we're having as a computer science community amongst the people that are working on these kinds of tools. In our lab, we have chosen not to distribute the, the synthesis tools. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if researchers contact us, we will talk to them and, you know, we can, we can uh, make arrangements to release the code. In right, because you could even have a legal agreement where they have liability if they violate exactly. terms of usage. Yeah. Yeah, so, but we just don't wanna, we, we wanna maintain a little bit of control over usage and, and build a little bit of trust with the people that are gonna use it. Um, I think, uh, you know, the other thing that we've been doing is developing tools to detect these kinds of manipulations. Now, before we move to detection, let me just ask, yeah. has there been any negative repercussions for your, to your decision not to freely release? I could imagine that in the academic world, people, re, you know, reviewing one of your papers might say, well, how can I know if this really works because they're not making the code available, blah, blah, blah. So um, I, I just want to highlight, is there a negative to not... Um, your reasons for doing it are very understandable, but I'm just wondering if you've experienced any repercussions from that decision. Yeah, from a from a you know from a research point of view, it's definitely a negative to not have access to the code. Um, we haven't experienced any direct repercussions, but 
when we want to compare our results to other people's results, we right. have the same issue. We can't access their code. Right. And so, um, so it makes it so that the whole research endeavor in this space slows down. Yes, that really does make sense. To, to push ahead. Let me let you get back. You were saying something very fascinating about now the uh, possibility of technologies to detect these kinds of lip syncs. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in our group and in other groups, people are, have recognized that uh, deep fakes can be used in nefarious ways. And so detection has become a big issue. And so we and others have developed tools to try and detect deep fakes. And in our, in our case, for example, we're trying to look at biometric signals. So are the lips moving in exactly the right way right. as they would in a real video. And, uh, and there's still some things that a computer can detect that are signatures of a deep fake. Um, so we're still at that stage, but we're very rapidly evolving. And I think ultimately, um, while working on these detect detection technologies is important, it's not gonna solve the problem of, uh, always detecting deep fakes and uh, creating misinformation. Because right. I think ultimately the issue here is that people are using deep fakes and lip syncing to tell lies, right? <laughs> Lying is the underlying issue. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, the liars will always get better and better <laughs> in right. their uses of the technology. And unfortunately we just don't have any technology that can accurately detect lying in all situations. So as we, it, it's a great point. And as we finish up, are there any kind of tips you can give just a regular uh, critical thinking viewer about um, how can they inform themselves uh, and how should they approach media when there's now this distinct possibility that what they're seeing is not real? Do you have any tips for the, the, the listeners basically who might be wondering what can I do to not be duped? Yeah, yeah. I think media literacy is critically important. And uh, I think um, really being aware of where the video is coming from, its provenance, um, yes. who is putting it out, who are the authors, what is the organization behind the video uh, can help us understand the point of view that that video is trying to convey. Even videos without deep fake technology, they're often edited in a way to convey a certain point of view. Sound bites may not be the entire statement that a person made. Right. And so you always right. want to exercise this muscle of, uh, you know, thinking critically about the source. It, it also strikes me that this has to be part of our, even our grade school curriculum. We have to train children from a very early age to consume media, but to consume it critically with an eye towards what the, uh, underlying messages in addition to the explicit messages of, of any piece of media are. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is uh, very, very important and is, is going to be one of the ways in which we address misinformation more generally. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.